In this video, I want to bring together that which we've talked about in the last few videos, that of the conditional independence assumption, and talking specifically about continuous variables, to talk about causality in regard to linear regression. So in order to talk about causality in regard to linear regression, we're going to make an assumption, and we're going to continue the example which we were talking about in the last video, which is the effect of exercise level on an individual's resting heart rate. And what we're going to assume is that the potential resting heart rate of an individual I who chooses to exercise an amount E is linear in the amount of exercise which they actually choose. So we assume that the potential level of heart rate for an individual I exercising an amount E is equal to alpha plus beta times the amount of exercise undertaken plus epsilon I, where Epsilon i here is a error term which captures all the other factors which affect an individual's potential level of resting heart rate. Just to reiterate, again, we're talking about an individual's potential level of resting heart rate, which, remember, in most cases is not actually observed. We only observe the level of heart rate which an individual actually obtains for an exercising an amount EI. Another thing to note about this relationship is that it doesn't have EI, it has E in it, because this is the idea is that this represents the causal relationship between any given exercise level and any potential heart rate which that individual would achieve. And as I said before, we've assumed that this is linear. We've also assumed that this functional relationship is the same for all individuals. That is, it's the same for all I. We don't have to make these two assumptions. We can, in fact, assume that the resting heart rate or the potential resting heart rate of an individual is both non-linear and there is a difference between different individuals. Um, and it does make the analysis a little bit more complicated. But the idea is that in both of the examples, we end up with regression actually representing some sort of weighted average of the causal effect of interest. Uh, and so I'm actually going to make the assumption that there is this linear relationship for the relationship between potential heart rate and an individual's level of exercise, and that it is the same for everyone. And remember, just like before, what we're actually interested in deriving is the causal effect of exercise, or specifically we're interested in what is the difference between the potential level of heart rate which an individual I would achieve if they exercised E plus one times, and the potential level of heart rate which an individual would achieve if they exercise just E times. And generally what we do is we take the unconditional expectation of this and that gives us the average treatment effect. And generally what we do is we take the expectation of this term delta I here and that gives us the average causal effect. From this top model here, we can actually derive the sort of model which we actually observe. And I'm gonna write it like this. The heart rate which an individual I actually is seen to actually output we're going to use this top model now to help us derive the model which we actually observe. So what I'm going to write is that the observed level of resting heart rate of an individual is equal to alpha plus beta times the level of exercise which they actually achieve, or actually choose rather, EI, plus this error term here, epsilon I. And note that because I've assumed that this top model here is causal, and the fact that this bottom model is just derived from this top model, all I've done is I've just put EI into this, then this bottom model also has a causal interpretation. So what's the problem with this bottom model? Well, the problem is that because the level of exercise which an individual achieves, or chooses rather, is not necessarily independent of all the other factors which are important in determining an individual's resting heart rate or potential resting heart rate, there is likely going to be some correlation between EI and epsilon I. And because of that, if we were to just go ahead and estimate this model, beta would be a biased estimate of the causal effect. So we want a way around this if possible. And I should note here that within epsilon I, what we're really sort of talking about is all the factors which affect an individual's potential level of resting heart rate. And those in general aren't going to necessarily be orthogonal to the level of exercise which an individual actually chooses. So how can we actually get around this problem? Well, one way we can do it is by using the conditional independence assumption. So just to restate the conditional independence assumption again, 
what this says is that the potential level of resting heart rate of an individual eye choosing an exercise level E, no E, not EI here, is independent of the exercise level which they actually choose, EI, given a list of covariates, which I'm going to call XI. And I'm going to write a line under it to denote the fact that we're talking about a vector of covariates here. So how can we use this conditional independence assumption to help us actually get an equation which allows us to estimate the average causal effect? Well, what we can do is we can include this list of covariates in our regression. So we're just going to have this equation which we have up here, except now we're going to include our vector of covariates. So I'm going to have xi, let's say, primed to denote the fact that we're talking about a vector product here, uh, and we want the sort of inner product so that we just get a list of each of these different covariates times a respective um, parameter delta plus vi. And the idea here is that vi by construction is orthogonal to xi. In other words, the expectation of vi given xi is equal to zero. Okay, so how does all this help us? Well, remember what we're actually trying to actually derive here. We're trying to derive the difference in the potential heart rate of an individual eye if they exercised E plus one times, and the potential level of heart rate which an individual would obtain if they exercised just E times. So what we're really interested in is the expectation of the potential level of resting heart rate if they exercised E times. And by extension, we could easily do this for E plus one times, and then we would have derived the causal effect. And what we're doing is we're trying to derive this conditional on the fact that we have these covariates here, xi, and conditional on the fact that we actually observe an individual exercising just ei times. Well, the conditional independence assumption allows us to rewrite this in a much simpler form, which is the fact that we can write this as the expectation of an individual's resting heart rate, or the potential level of an individual's resting heart rate, given just xi, because what the conditional independence assumption says is that Conditional on xi, h, r, i, e is actually independent of ei. So we can actually remove this ei from the expression here. And that allows us to write the expectation of resting heart rate of an individual i if they exercise e times. So how does that help us? Well, essentially what that allows us to do now is it allows us to calculate the expectation of this term here given xi, which allows us to calculate the expectation of the entire right-hand side but remember, what we've actually done is we've decomposed epsilon i into the sum of the sort of parts which is due to xi and that which is due to vi, which is actually orthogonal to xi by construction. And so what we get is when we actually evaluate this expectation, which is equivalent to evaluating the expectation on this term, then we just get that this is equal to alpha plus beta times e plus xi primed times delta. And because of the fact that the expectation of vi given xi is equal to zero, this vi term actually vanishes. And that's the important thing about the conditional independence assumption. Note that now what we have is we have that the conditional um, expectation of an individual's potential level of heart rate is now independent of vi. There's no vi which occurs in this expression here. And remember that part of the epsilon i which we were worried about was the fact that it actually really contained the potential level of heart rate of an individual i if they exercised ei times. And note that when we actually take this conditional expectation of the potential level of heart rate given xi and given ei, there is no part of this which contains vi. So there's no function of vi here. So in other words, what this tells us is that the covariance between vi and EI, given this list of covariates, is equal to zero because of the fact that we've ascertained that HRI EI is now independent of VI. What that means is that we can actually go ahead and we can estimate this relationship here, this, if I just underline it here. And the idea is that because there is no correlation between EI and VI, we now will be able to estimate this relationship and beta will now be an unbiased estimator of the average causal effect.
And just to reiterate, the reason that this beta is actually representing the average causal effect is that it is the same beta which appears in this relationship here when we're actually estimating the potential or they're taking the expectation of the potential level of heart rate of an individual if they exercise E times. And it is this equivalence between this beta here and this beta here which actually allows us then to estimate the average causal effect because it's this relationship here which determines HRIE, which then we could get HRIE plus one from, or, or take that from HRIE plus one, and that would give us the average causal effect.